In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we're going to talk about fire hardening spears, froth in water after filtering, and hunting in the context of wider bushcraft. Welcome, welcome to episode 73 of Ask Paul Kirtley. Now 73 is quite a special number to me. I was born in 1973, so has a little resonance there. And we are in a very wet and windy Sussex today. Um, bitter northerly wind coming through, very cold for the end of April, and it's been raining on and off heavily for several days, and particularly the last 24 hours, we've had about a month's worth of rain in that time. So I'm sat under a tarp today because even though the worst of the rain seems to have passed now, it's still coming through in showers, the wind is blowing, it's coming off the trees, and camera equipment and microphones and rain don't tend to mix very well. So. Here I am, sat under a tarp. And yes, <laughs> the joke continues, I will stay dry. Now, I've got a couple of videos on YouTube, um, slightly tongue in cheek, about sitting under tarps and staying dry. And the one where I said inside dry, outside wet, I was in the woods. And it was in response to comments about another video that I'd made about a lightweight tarp and bivy setup where people had said it won't keep you dry. And that was set up in the woods. And yet, people are still telling me it won't keep me dry, tarps don't keep you dry. If you're putting tarps up in the woods where they make sense, you've got those upright things called trees, and yes, I am being slightly sarcastic, upright things called trees that you can attach the tarps to, they make perfect sense. Also, in the woods, even today, it's gusting to 50 miles an hour wind, okay? The edge of the woods is quite a way that way. I'm very sheltered where I am. I'm in the woods, it's a very windy day, and yet there is no rain blowing in the side of this tar. If I was on the edge of the woods over there, half a mile that way, where it opens onto a field, I'd be getting wet if I'd set this tarp up. So if you're putting a tarp up in the woods and you're getting wet, you're doing something wrong. It's not the tarp. It's the way that you're setting it up. It's where you're putting it. So the argument isn't that tarps don't keep you dry ever. My argument is that tarps will keep you dry in the woods if you put them up correctly. And so, yes, I might sound slightly condescending if I say that you're doing something wrong or you're talking from a, a point of inexperience. Because if you're experienced at using tarps, in the woods, and it's not just me that says this, if you're experienced at using tarps in the woods, you won't get water in. Now, you won't get water flowing under the sides because you've sighted it correctly, you're not in a local dip. You won't get water blowing in the sides, even on a windy day like today, because you're not on the edge of the woods, you're inside the woods. All the water is coming vertically down off the trees. That's why tarps work in the woods. They work in tropical rainforests where it rains a hell of a lot more than here. Yes, okay, you might be in a hammock up off the ground, but the tarp still works to keep you dry. So that is the argument. That is, that is the extent of it. And yet I've got people coming to my YouTube channel and telling me, well, it won't work in the mountains. It won't work in an alpine environment. It won't work um, in Dartmoor when there's sideways rain. It won't work. I know that. I know that. I'm not even talking about that. Do your homework about what I'm talking about. Somebody just wrote a diatribe, completely incoherent, no punctuation, no capitals. Yeah, it reads like an idiot's letter to somebody, okay? Yes, I'm being condescending, okay? But if you're gonna engage in, with me in an argument, at least have some sense of structure and grammar rather than just some random, it looks like you've written it when you've drunk. You probably were the time it was posted last night. So people are continuing to say, that tarps that work in the woods, they do. 
They work in tropical rainforests, they work in the woods in the UK, they work in the woods in Sweden, they work in the woods in other places. Yes, there might be problems with insects in some places and you might need a mosquito net like you do in the rainforest. In the mountains, of course, a tent is a better option. A mountain tent is a better option. If you follow me and watch my stuff, you see that I use a Hilleberg Acto, a Hilleberg Nalo. I use them on their own. I use them in combination with tarps. Don't engage with me with abusive messages on YouTube when you don't even know what I do for a living. You don't even, you haven't seen the extent of what I do. Um, the comment was in response to the use of tarps in the woods. They work in the woods. If you don't think they work in the woods, fine. Okay, but that's not the reality if you use them properly. If you don't want to use a tarp in the woods, fine, use a tent. But don't tell me that they don't work because I sleep out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nights. I've slept out hundreds and hundreds of nights in tarps and I will continue to do so and I don't get wet. I don't care what your opinion is, I don't get wet under a tarp. If you get wet under a tarp, you're doing something different. That's it, it's logic, it's, it, it's, it's reality. It's not about argument or opinion. I don't get wet under a tarp in the rain, okay? I am bored with the conversation. Stop leaving me stupid abusive messages under my YouTube channel videos. I know there are better options in the mountains. It's not about that, it's about in the woods. I hope that is completely clear now for the hard of learning, okay? Thank you. <laughs> and yes, I haven't had a rant for a while, but you know, I've just been teaching for two weeks. Um, it's been a long two weeks. I've had a couple of great weeks, a couple of great groups. It's been wonderful, um, but I am a bit tired now and I've got my coffee and I have three questions to answer for you. So I will do that. Hashtag rant Paul Kirtley if you like. But working with nature is not, and I say this on my elementary course, it's not about what your opinion is. It's about what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, that's it. It's not, you know, it, it's not about what you think should work. Go out, try it. If things are not working for you, or either it either just doesn't work at all, fair enough, but if other people are having a different experience, you've got to look at what you're doing. To examine and re-examine your assumptions and, and your methods. Right, here we have a question. Fire hardening spears, and this is from Robert Smith, Rob Smith. And he says, hi Paul, love the blog and podcast. I've just read an interesting paper on fire hardened spears and he's put the link there. And I, I, I can't link to it on YouTube, but I'll put the link in the show notes. I can only link to related sites, which are my sites off directly off cards. I can put it in the show notes. I'll link to that paper. It's an academic paper, um, piece of academic research, which I've read, uh, Rob, thank you, so, subsequent to you sending this to me. Um, and Rob continues, uh, I've read this paper that suggests our ancestors used fire hardening for easing the cutting of wood into a point rather than making it stronger. The study also claims fire hardened wood is more brittle and more likely to break off. In our time of Scandi grinds and super steels, is fire hardening of wood really a useful skill for modern day bushcraft? I'd also be very interested in hearing about your particular process for hardening or softening wood for bending. Thanks, Rob Smith. Well, I read the article and a couple of things spring to mind. Um, first off, um, they come to a conclusion based on testing one species of wood. They use uh, European hazel, Carillus avalana, and that's all well and good, but you know as well as I do, most people watching this, if they've done any sort of woodworking, any sort of woodcraft, um, whether it's sort of workshop based wood carving or woodcraft or carpentry or more uh, field expedient stuff out in the, in the field, woodcraft, campcraft, um, green wood carving, different woods have different properties. Um, and I think probably a further study needs to be done. And I think it also needs to be linked more closely to woods that are thought to have been used or are observed to be used now. Because um, a, an African wood that's used as a digging stick to dig up tuberous roots by say the Hadza is going to be very different potentially than um, a hazel coppice growing in the north of England. 
And so I think, I think we need to be, I think it's useful to have that data, but I think there needs to be more data before we come to any great conclusions. They also refer to the Clacton Spear, um, which uh, is a U uh, piece of wood. It was found at Clacton on Sea um, in amongst um, a dig that was um, looking for other things, but they unearthed this uh, piece of U that is thought to be several hundred thousand years old. And that's a piece of U. It's not hazel. Um, so yes, there are some commonalities, angiosperm trees, there are, there are commonalities, but there are also a lot of differences within that. You know, um, I've just run a woodcraft course and we've used sweet chestnut, we've used hazel, we've used birch, we've used uh, willow, we've used um, holly. Those are the main species we've used in the last week, but they've all got quite different qualities. Um, um, we used uh, hazel to, to bend to make a, an improvised bow saw, for example, and there we're heating it over the fire and that starts to soften it. You get a kind of internal steam bending process. It um, loosens the lignin and you can bend it into a shape to accept a saw and we make improvised bow saws that way. Other woods don't work so well for that. Um, hazel withies up really, really well. You can twist it up into um, a fibrous wire, if you like, that's very flexible, and you can then put that into a knot. You can tie clove hitches with it, you can do timber hitches with it. Um, species such as sweet chestnut, it will accept something of a twist, but you can't tie knots in it, you can't um, tie uh, timber hitches in it and things, it will just break. Same with birch, you can twist it around and double it over, you can get it to withy a little bit, but if you try and withy it like hazel or willow, it will break. So every different wood has got different properties. And so I think before we can come to any firm conclusions about the value of putting wood into fire for the purposes of hardening or creating resilience, um, I think we need more data. The other thing is, there's, there's, a, there's a very different use case for something that's a digging stick, where it's repeated abrasive contact with the ground, and a spear, where you want something that's as sharp and penetrating as possible. It might not matter that a spear breaks off once it's penetrated the animal. So the, the, the optimization there might be just for sharpness. Whereas for digging, it may be resilient. Sharpness isn't so important. You want it to last longer. You certainly don't want it to break off after one piece of contact. So I think the uses are very different. And I think trying to group those together um, to determine whether fire hardening is valuable or not, I think it needs to be more delineated. And I think different. I think you need to have a range of different woods, data on a lot of different woods for each use case before you can draw conclusions. Um, people who live close to the land as hunter-gatherers do, as our ancestors are thought to have done, um, have intimate knowledge of the qualities of different materials. And there are different qualities to each material. Every tree, every plant, every uh, fiber, every wood, even the same species at different stages of growth, they have different qualities. And the more you work with those materials, the more you realize that and you use the optimal um, ones where you can and then you learn about treating them in a way that gives you the optimal result for the end result that you're trying and they're they're quite different um, often so it's an interesting study but I would suggest that they need to uh, test a lot more species and test them on specific use cases um, and that might result in a little bit more data um, but I think they're right to ask the question. It's, it's in, it, you know, there are a lot of assumptions in archaeology. There are a lot of assumptions in drawing conclusions from what modern day hunter-gatherers might do versus what our ancestors might do. And I think it's good to link what we found from the archaeological record with potential uses and um, remove the assumptions and test those assumptions um, and replace them with some hard data. I don't think there's any harm in that, but I think it's I think we need to be wary not to jump to great conclusions based on one study of one species for, uh, for generalised conclusions. Is fire useful for cutting wood? Absolutely. Um, 
you know, we, we, we've observed that people do that in many places. Um, it, you know, if you've got a large piece of wood and you don't have a cutting tool, but you've got a fire, um, even green wood, as long as the fire's big enough, you can put it across the fire where you want to cut it and, and weaken it, burn it through in that place, um, even quite a large piece. So it would make sense potentially for shorter pieces to be treated in the same way. Um, so that they could then be scraped down into a point where the fire had created that taper anyway where it's burnt, burnt, burnt through in the middle. That might just be a, a, a labour saving process um, rather than trying to uh, create that point from scratch when people didn't have steel tools. If they were using stone tools, of course, stone tools are really quite capable if you know how to use them, you know how to make them well and know how to use them well. But even so, if you've got a campfire and you can just pop a green stick on top while you go off and do something else, it's burnt through and then you can just scrape it down to a point. That's a lot less effort, isn't it? Interesting. Froth in water after After filtering, this is a voicemail question. I'm just going to have to pull the voicemail question. This is from Tom Ireland. I'm out in the field, so I haven't quite got all of these things into my filing system. Here we go. Hey, Paul. I wanted to ask about filtering in a brown bag. I have twice filtered from a barn which does not seem to have any farm related runoff and I have not become ill after boiling, but the water seems to froth up after filtering or after boiling when shaken in my water bottle. Do you know what this might indicate and should I avoid filtering from the source? Could it simply be microscopic organic matter which has passed through the bag? The water is quite peaty. Cheers Tom. All right, Tom. Um, so Tom has taken water from uh, a stream, a burn, as he refers to it. Um, he is in Scotland. Um, but just translating for maybe some of our transatlantic listeners and watchers. Um, so he's taken water from what appears to be a stream that's clear of um, any sort of agricultural runoff, um, peaty area. And he's putting it through a brown bag, so a coarse filter. Um, that removes any turbidity, removes silt, sand, uh, floating, larger, decaying organic matter, etc. So it should be quite visibly clear into a, into a billy pot, billy can, and then he's boiling it to sterilise the water. And boiling, when you bring water to a rolling boil, um, below 2,000 metres, 6,000 feet, rolling boil is sufficient to kill any pathogenic organism which might be in there, whether it be protozoa, bacteria or viruses. Remember, above 2,000 metres or 6,000 feet, you should bring it to a rolling boil and let it boil for uh, three to four minutes. Um, and that will be sufficient time because, of course, water boils at a lower temperature. The higher up you go, the higher elevation you are, the lower the temperature. So above 2,000 metres, 6,000 feet, you need to bring it to a rolling boil and then keep it boiling for longer so that it's, even though it's been exposed to a lower heat, it's going for long enough to still kill all the pathogenic organisms. So Tom is uh, definitely below 2,000 metres and 6,000 feet. It being in Scotland, as Ben Nevis is the highest point in Scotland and it's lower than that. Um, and so rolling boil will have killed everything and it'll be safe to drink. Of course, if there are no pesticides and heavy metals and things in there, um, but he's assuming that there isn't. So that will be safe to drink. And the question then is, if there is some frothiness in that water, what's causing it? Well, it could be what causes the natural frothiness that you sometimes get into streams and rivers. Um, it, there are a number of substances, including saponins, which come from the trees. Saponins are a natural chemical. They're related to soaps and they can cause a, a frothiness. Um, it, you can sometimes see it at the base of trees even. So some of these sweet chestnut trees and birch trees that are in here, both those species have saponins in their leaves and you can sometimes see in heavy rain as the rain comes down the trunks having come off the, the leaves that you get some frothiness at the base of the trees and you eventually get that into watercourses and that can uh, cause frothiness and there are a number of other similar chemicals uh, and the related processes which cause that frothy scum. We've had questions about it before on 
uh, ask Paul Kirtley. I can't remember off the top of my head which episode, but if I do um, locate that episode, I will link to it below this uh, video, whether you're watching on YouTube or on my blog. And if you're listening, just go to Ask Paul Kirtley. 73 so paulkirtley.co.uk ask paulkirtley73 and you'll find all the show notes there um so that could be one thing that's causing the frothiness the other thing that could be causing the frothiness is if you're cleaning your water bottles or your billy can with um detergent um so washing up liquid uh, fairy liquid uh, or, or similar um there could be residue from cleaning your bottles or cleaning your billy can and that could be in the water and even a small amount of that would be enough to cause some froth um, because that stuff uh, takes a lot of diluting before it loses its effectiveness it's quite concentrated typically so it could just be a residue of your cleaning processes as well would be another thought Um, and you're not supposed to clean brown bags um, with any sort of cleaning products but again if you if you have done I'm not saying you have but I'm just working through the possibilities again if you've cleaned the brown bag with any sort of cleaning product washing up liquid or, or similar there might also be some residue getting in that way um, so those are my two thoughts um, it's either naturally occurring soapy like substances um, that are coming naturally and are not going to cause you any harm or it could be a residue of your uh, washing process potentially cleaning process for, of your of your pot or your bottle most likely alrighty next question this is from Maisie it's another speak pipe question Glad that people are using the speak. Okay, I can't say speak. Speak pipe, not speak but pike. Speak pipe um, facility on my blog. Um, it does cost me some money to have that there, so I'm glad that people are using it. It's nice to hear people's voices as well as get written questions. Um, I just need to pull that one up. Where's it gone? It's disappeared. Okay, do that one again. I normally have these, if I've prepared them, the questions at home, I would have them in my notes already, but I have to link through to the actual download file here and pray that I've got decent reception. Hi Paul, just want to find out your views on the hunting side of things. Uh, air, airsoft, um, air pellet, rimfire, um, where does it come in the, the greater picture with uh, bushcraft and yourself? You, you don't really mention it. I can't recall ever mentioning any of your uh, blog, cl- blog casts or YouTube videos. Never heard you mention anything about the hunting side of things. So what are your views and uh, looking forward to the uh, bushcraft show? All right, um, Maisie. So I would make the distinction between... So uh, people use the word hunting for different things. Um, and so I would make the distinction between sort of hunting with dogs, fox hunting, um, that style of hunting, group of people on horses, group of people with dogs or combination that word gets used for hunting or has been used for hunting in Britain I'm assuming we're not talking about that Um, you've mentioned firearms so we're talking about taking animals with firearms and I do think it's part of wider bushcraft I think the ability to go out and source your own food is part of the bushcraft skill set whether it's trapping whether it's shooting. Of course, there are some ethical questions around that and some people would um, not want to include that in their uh, practice of bushcraft skills. Um, But I think if we're going to be inclusive about the subject as a whole, um, ultimately, if we're talking about uh, living from the land, um, then fishing, trapping, hunting come within that remit. 
we were just talking about hunter gatherers and we're talking about ancestors and hunter gatherers and they're not an analog yep people living in the current age that hunt and gather are not an analog for our prehistoric ancestors but we might be able to draw conclusions so i just want to be clear about that we might be able to draw some inferences from from each but um you know hunter gatherers are clearly hunting as well as gathering and there's an ongoing debate about w which is uh, more important um are they should they really be called gatherer hunters that most of the time that they're gathering um fruits and seeds and nuts and berries and um, tuberous roots and then sometimes gaining some meat you know, we're an omnivorous species um we're quite versatile in what we can eat and we can subsist on a vegetarian diet provided we um gain a good enough uh, range of foods um I would say it's hard to live in the northern temperate zone um, on a purely vegetarian diet on native species. There are plenty of people in the UK and Western Europe and North America who do live on vegetarian diets and I have no um, issue with that. I was actually vegetarian myself for about seven years when I was younger when I was doing a lot of um, competitive cycling. It just seemed to agree with me keeping my body weight down. Um, and so I, I didn't eat, I ate, occasionally ate some fish, but um, for a long time I didn't eat any meat. And that seemed to suit me in my 20s, uh, late teens and early 20s when I was doing a lot of exercise. So I have absolutely no issues with people living a, a vegetarian uh, lifestyle, eating vegetarian uh, only diet. Um, but clearly to get good quality vegetables and good quality plant proteins um, you need to source those things from quite far and wide um, most of the th vegetables that we get in the supermarket are cultivated there many of them are not native species to the UK if we're talking about the UK in general there are, we've kind of cherry-picked the best from all over the world as, as it were and made that the kind of standard uh, you know whether it's peppers or capsicums or potatoes or um, courgettes or many things um, many many things we were kind of pulled from all over the place so that we've got these foods presented to us and then there's a question of can we make them available year round you know blueberries from Morocco and Chile and you know rather than just having seasonal foods if you start trying to live on seasonal foods um, on a vegetarian diet it, I think it's a little bit harder and I think if you try and live off the land on a vegetarian diet in the northern temperate uh, or the boreal, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible. Um, partly because the plant foods are just not there. The range of plant foods are not there and the calorie uh, requirements are higher. If you're in the tropics, I think it's easier. And um, that's just a general point. So just a background point. So I, I think in many places, um, hunting has a place um, I don't think it's the be all and end all. I think you need to have, I think we generally we should have higher fiber content in our diets than we do. So we should be eating a lot of plant foods. Um, you know, there are plenty of studies that suggest that that's the case. Um, so, you know, high dietary fiber uh, requirements suggest that we should be eating lots of plant foods and, you know, we should be eating whole plant foods um, rather than just fruit juices and, and whatnot. You should be taking the whole thing. Um, lots of probably more tuberous roots than we eat. Um, but meat has a place in that um, as a whole, I think. And so then it's a question of what's legal. So bow hunting is not legal in the UK. Um, it is legal in other parts of the world. It's legal in parts of North America. Um, and that brings us to firearms then and so you're based in the UK clearly so we'll talk in the UK context but I think it applies more generally you know modern firearms give us the ability to go out and source food in a relatively ethical way um, because let's face it traps are pretty brutal um, you know our ancestors may have been hunting with spears they may have been hunting with bows and arrows as well um, but they will certainly have been using some sort of trapping methods as well um, because what info that we have about people who've been living off the land relatively recently, whether it's ethnographic accounts of First Nations in North America, whether it's looking at um, hunter-gatherers from around the world, they use various different trapping methods, whether it's trapping wild pigs in the jungle, whether it's trapping snowshoe hares, um, all of those things, all of those different methods have been used around the world. And um, it's not the nicest way for an animal to go. 
And so I think if we want to continue to take animals from the wild, um, shooting with a firearm is a relatively ethical way of doing it because the, if you do it right, the animal doesn't know you're there, it doesn't know what's hit it, one minute it's, it's feeding or moving around, going about its business and then doesn't know what's hit it, much better than it being stressed and, and caught in a trap for, for many, many hours potentially and then potentially still being alive when you get there and being stressed about you approaching it. Um, not to say that there isn't a, a value, from, certainly from a survival skills perspective, of learning about trapping, but I think you have to apply it with, uh, you know, with ethics at the, at the front. So uh, airsoft, I, th I think you probably meant air rifle, but airsoft I don't think has anything to do with it. You know, dressing up in um, tactical gear, running around the woods with you know, MP5s and things, um, airsoft I'm sure is a, is, is a lot of fun and I've got no, nothing against people who do that. Um, but I don't think that's got anything to do with bushcraft. I think that's just kind of playing soldiers and, you know, we all did that as kids and it's fun, but um, it's it's nothing really to do with bushcraft. Um, air rifle, yeah, they're useful uh, tools. Um, I've done plenty of air rifle shooting over the years and, um, you know, rabbits, pigeons primarily, and it's a good way particularly for a teenager and into, you know, in, in, in your teens. Um, I got my first air rifle. I think it's a good way of being able to source some, some wild food. Um, 2-2 rimfire works very well, of course, as well. And particularly now that you can get moderated 2-2 rimfires, it's a very good way of um, sourcing rabbits, for example. Um, I don't do it personally, but here on the uh, on the estate where we run a lot of our courses, we um, have the gamekeeper uh, source rabbits for us, and he'll go out um, with a powerful lamp and um, get the rabbits at night. And it's a lot better way than putting lots and lots of snares out that might be somewhat indiscriminate and catch other other wildlife. I mean, it's hard with the best intentions when you put brass snares out not to catch pheasants, not to catch hedgehogs, not to catch badgers. Um, they're all roaming around um, and with the best will in the world those things do happen um, and so I think going out with a, a 2-2 rim fire uh, with a moderator on it particularly using subsonic rounds moderator lamp um, it's quite a quick and easy way of sourcing those things and with little stress to the to the prey and then when you come on to um, deer um, I have talked quite a lot about deer stalking. Um, I've done a couple of podcasts with Andy Chatterton of Moray Outfitting and the Stalking School up in, in Scotland, and we've discussed deer stalking. Um, I uh, do partake in deer stalking activities, um, but I don't. I don't shoot. I don't shoot. Um, I don't. I'm not interested personally in driven shoots. I don't. I don't shoot pheasants with shotguns and things. It's not. I don't think that's hunting. Um, it might be sport, but I don't think it's hunting. I'm interested in hunting. Rough shooting with shotguns, sure. Um, I think that's more um, closer to, to hunting, but um, driven organized shooting with um, plus fours and uh, lots of drinking, it's, that's not really hunting in my book. Um, it might be fun, um, but then there's the ethics involved of should killing animals be fun uh, you know don't get me wrong I know it goes on in the countryside and there are some benefits of it um, both in terms of keeping estates whole and them not being turned into housing estates or being chewed up into tiny little parcels of land because the estate can't afford to keep the land as a whole and it's managed as a whole and there are some benefits to that I get all of that but I'm just saying personally that's not something that interests me um, I enjoy shooting shotguns um, but I'm not interested in driven shooting I think that's a separate thing whether it's on the moors or in the woods. Um, but deer stalking, I think, is a skill, um, and I think it's a, a skill that's close to some of the skills that we would have applied in the past of getting close to prey, moving quietly through the woods, observing where animals are. Um, most of it's not about the shooting, that's the thing. You have to be a good shot and you have to know how to use the rifle safely, etc. And we're talking using a 243 or a 308, for example. Um, and of course, if you're operating in areas where there may be other people around, there are safety considerations. So you need to be trained. I've done my DSC-1. Um, I think that's a very valuable thing for people to do if they're interested in deer stalking. Um, 
but yes i don't shout about it there's a couple of reasons um one is that if, we, if we're talking youtube youtube doesn't like people talking about guns and hunting um and shooting um and less and less so but that's a lot of that's to do with what's going on in the states um and the issues uh you know there are issues there um I understand both sides of the argument there, but there are clearly issues with um, guns in the states and people people being shot that uh, you know innocent people being shot with with firearms. And clearly, there are some concerns about what's on the internet around that. And I know that, but that's that's a different thing. But even so, um, certainly I know that some YouTube channels that talk about hunting and shooting, even within the context of survival or bushcraft, have been um, potentially penalised. Um, that seems to be what's happening. Certainly some people who are involved in those channels seem to think they're being penalised for having that content there. So that's one reason there isn't a lot of hunting, trapping, um, shooting content on my on my channel. Um, I've certainly talked about it in my podcast though. Um, those two episodes with Andy Chatterton, as I say, it's not the Ask Paul Kirtley po podcast, it's the Paul Kirtley podcast. I have two separate podcasts. So if you're not aware of that, if you don't subscribe to both, Paul Kirtley podcast is my podcast, which is primarily um, an interview based podcast where I have guests, uh, specialists in their field, experts in their field, um, people with unique experiences that can bring their uh, experiences and their lessons to bear on the wider um, the wider public, if you like, the wider audience that we can all learn from, whether it's Leon McCarran walking through the desert of the Middle East, whether it's Cassie Quave talking about um, studying plants from a medical perspective, medical ethnobotany and, and traditional uses of plants from a, from a medical perspective, um, whether it's Lou Rudd um, doing uh, feats of endurance in the Antarctic. Um, all of those people have things that we can learn from and everything, every one of those podcasts is, is interesting in different, in different ways. So check out the ones with Andy Chatterton there if you're interested in the shooting side. Um, and yeah, I do think it's part of the wider skill set, but I also respect people who don't want to include it within their outdoor life, within their, um, you know, if they want to just go camping, um, be good at campcraft, fire lighting, um, natural navigation, finding their way, they may never need or want to get involved in firearms so that's that's kind of my view on it and I hope that's clear um, you know we could spend hours talking about it but I think that answers your question in terms of um, what my position is what my involvement is um, what my interests are and how I view it why in, in the wider bushcraft field um, and, and clearly when you're overseas in places like Canada for example you know a lot of people go into the bush um, for hunting and for shooting um, as well as fishing and canoeing and it's it's part of that um, culture and it's the same in, in Scandinavia as well. I find it interesting that you go into some of the outdoor stores in, in Scandinavia where you've got you know you've got your hiking gear, you've got your cross-country skiing gear, you've got your ice hockey gear, or you've got various other, you've got all of your um, your your dog leads and um, then there's all the hunting gear and then there's shotguns and rifles at the back of the outdoor store and it's all in the same shop so it's very much integrated into the outdoor life there as well um, yeah so that's 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 my view thanks for the questions those are all the questions for this episode episode 73 of Ask Paul Kirtley I've enjoyed that it stopped raining and so I will make a move and um, I will see you on the next episode of Ask Paul Kirtley and if I could ask you to subscribe to this uh, channel if you're watching on YouTube and if you are listening on a podcast app if you could subscribe to the podcast via your favorite podcast app that really helps the visibility of the podcast it helps it, it get in front of other people who may also find this useful and that of course then means we get more great questions which means more great information for everyone who listens so thank you for your attention thank you for the questions guys and I look forward to speaking to you on the next episode of Ask Paul Kirtley. Thank you.